Hello. I'm John Chaich, the Director of Communications for the American Federation for Aging Research. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar, It's Not Just What You Eat, by what, But When. Today's webinar is co-hosted by AFAR and Next Avenue. The American Federation for Aging Research is a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to support and advance healthy aging through biomedical research. Since 1981, AFAR has provided more than $178 million to more than 4,100 talented investigators and students, invigorating research that will help us stay healthier for longer as we grow older. Next Avenue is public media's first and only national journalism service for America's booming 50-plus population, delivering vital ideas, context, and perspectives on issues that matter most as we age. Afar is thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar with Next Avenue. Grateful for all of you for being here today. And it's my pleasure to introduce Afar's scientific director, Stephen Ostad, who will moderate today's webinar. Stephen Ostad is also the co-principal investigator of the NIA's Nathan Schock Centers of Excellence Coordinating Center. He's a distinguished professor and department chair in the Department of Biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Dr. Ostad's research interests include figuring out why organisms age at different rates, particularly in especially long-lived organisms. He's also interested in studying indicators of animal health span, as well as the effects of rapamycin on mouth, mouse health span. He's the author of more than 190 scientific articles and more than 100 newspaper columns on science. His book, Why We Age, What Science is Discovering About the Body's Journey Through Life, has been translated into eight languages. On behalf of AFAR, Dr. Ofsted also writes a regular column for PBS Next Avenue, and we hope that you'll follow him on Twitter at Stephen Ofsted. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, John, and welcome, everyone. Um, we're looking forward to a really exciting time today. I'd like to start off by noting how proud AFAR is to have supported the research of today's uh, presenters, and we're really excited to hear about their perspectives and their results their innovative work gives us a great deal of optimism that, that research is really beginning to help us understand how we can stay healthier for longer as we grow older. And we hope that these presentations will stimulate a, a fantastic uh, discussion, inspire all the participants to learn more about the aging research that AFAR supports. So the first speaker I'd like to introduce is uh, Dr. Sachin Panda. Uh, Dr. Panda received AFAR's Julie Martin Mid-Career Award in Aging Research in 2014. He is a professor, a, a director of the Regulatory Biology Laboratory at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. His research explores genes, molecules, and cells that govern and regulate the, the body's circadian clock. Uh, his lab discovered that confining uh, calorie consumption to 8 to 10 hour period as people did in the distant past, might stave off all kinds of modern uh, diseases. He's also exploring whether the benefits of time-restricted feeding apply to humans, as well as the very uh, extensive work in mice. And Dr. Pounda has also identified a pair of genes that help keep eating schedules in sync with daily sleep cycles, making you feel hungry for meals at the same time every day. A few scholar. He's an executive member of the Center for Circadian Biology at the University of California, San Diego. And importantly, he's the author of a recent book, The Circadian Code, and the app, My Circadian Clock, that helps you understand your body's rhythm while contributing to research. So uh, Dr. Panda, welcome. And uh, please begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Um, before I begin, I would like to give you a context of uh, how we got here. So, for example, if we think of the year 19, uh, 1910, if a baby was born in that year, he or she was expected to live 
only up to 45 years of age. And now, a baby born in the U.S. is expected to live up to 80 years. How did that happen? So for thousands of years, infectious disease were the biggest threat to human health. And all of these diseases used to kill us very early on. Some of the disease names are here. And what is interesting is nearly half of the audience may not even recognize half of the disease here. And what happened almost 100 to 150 years ago was a single theory that drove biomedical research to prevent or eradicate these diseases. And that was the germ theory of disease. That uh, hypothesized that the germs of bacteria get entry into our body and then cause disease. That led to sanitation, vaccination, and antibiotics. And if we look for the last 100 years, every year of biomedical research increased human lifespan by on an average of three months. And most of it is based on this foundation of germ theory. But at the same time, now that we are living up to the age of 80, it has not been a smooth journey because half of our life is spent fighting many non-infectious chronic diseases. These are not infectious. These are most of them are not caused by external agents or pathogens. But we slowly recognize that many of them may be caused by the bad lifestyle uh, choices that we make. At the same time, we are in need of a unifying or a very simple theory, just like the germ theory of disease, to drive the next generation of research uh, to prevent or manage this disease. And I'd like to, in that context, I'd like to introduce the idea of circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms literally mean nearly 24-hour rhythms. These are essentially a daily timetable of various biochemical processes and behaviors, physiology, such as sleep-wake cycles, that our body is programmed to undergo every 24 hours. And if we think carefully, although circadian rhythm often raises the idea of sleep and wakefulness, in fact, every day, as we go through the day-night cycle, in the evening, in preparation of sleeping, our body actually cools down one or two hours before we go to bed. And then our deep sleep happens around 2 o'clock. And anticipating waking up, our body temperature will rise. As soon as we wake up, our melatonin drops, cortisol level rise, bowel movement will be more likely in the morning, insulin sensitivity is much better in the morning, and then high alertness is around this time in the middle of the day. And as the day progresses, our muscle performance peaks, and then we get ready for the bed. And what is interesting is if we look but think carefully about all these rhythms. These rhythms essentially regulate three foundations of health. That is sleep, nutrition, and physical activity. And we know that lifestyle is essentially what, when, and how much we eat, sleep, and move around on a daily basis. And in fact, all of these three foundations of health are also regulated controlled by circadian clock. Over the last 20 years, this field of circadian rhythm research has identified that almost every organ in our body has circadian clocks. And these clocks regulate when we sleep, how much we sleep, and the quality of sleep. Similarly, the clocks also give instruction to our physiology for nutrition, how much we should eat, or physical activity. Interestingly, these three components also interact with the clock. So that means if we sleep at the wrong time, or if we sleep, not sleep enough, or if we have bad nutrition, or if we have less physical activity, that also affects the clock. So in this context, let's think what has changed in the last 150 years. So this simple two charts essentially compare how our daily rhythms used to be maybe 150 years ago, when there was no electrical lighting. So people lived in agrarian society or as hunter-gatherers. They had clear 24 hours rhythms in which 12 hours was largely um, exposed to daylight. They had plenty of daylight. 
in the evening, there was very little of firelight, and then they had access to uh, darkness, and that induced sleep and supported sleep for eight to nine hours. During daytime, there was plenty of physical activity. Food was scarce, so people got to eat maybe two or maximum three meals. But all of this eating activity was done by uh, maybe little after evening. But after modern after modernization of society, now we have we spend most of our daytime in indoor spaces, so we are not exposed to that much of bright light. At night time, again, we are exposed to dim light from our computers and TVs, and also we have electrical lighting. The opportunity to sleep has decreased. Our physical activity is pretty low, and what has increased is opportunity to eat. So as long as our eyes are open, our mouth is open, and we are asked to eat almost six, seven, eight times, so this combination of low physical activity, the lack of a clear light-dark cycle, and then extended period of eating, all of these three or any one of them can disrupt circadian rhythm. So over the last 20 years, a lot of papers have been published in both animal models and human studies connecting how circadian rhythm disruption can lead to increased risk for certain diseases. And this is just a partial list. So for example, if we lose sleep, or eat at the wrong time for two or three days, just like among shift workers, then that might be some discomfort. So these are actually not diseases, but discomforts. But if this continues for several days, weeks, or months, then slowly our risk for, risk for many of these chronic diseases increase. And as you can see, as we get older, then the risk for circadian rhythm disruption leading to disease yeah and more severe diseases also go up. And in fact, if we think carefully about the epidemiology of this disease, the ones that are in red that affect more than 10% of the population, and the ones that are in yellow affect more than 5% of the population. So we can clearly see that a vast majority of chronic diseases that affect us um, are may be contributed by circadian rhythm disruption. Then the question is, well, how much disruption is, will increase the risk for disease? So this is where modern research is showing that only four to five nights of not getting enough sleep can reduce your glucose tolerance and increase insulin resistance. And in fact, the definition of shift work that's adopted in many European countries is staying awake for at least two to three hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. for at least once a week. So as you can imagine, most of you at least know someone, and many of you may yourself be um, staying awake for two to three hours between 10 a.m. and 5 a.m. So that is enough to disrupt our circadian clock. So now we can think of how to use this knowledge of circadian rhythm to prevent or manage disease. So that falls into three categories. One is what I call training the clock. How do we adopt healthy lifestyle that will support our circadian clock? And then the two other, clocking the drugs, we are also um, now learning that most of the drugs may have a preferred time when they have best effect and at the non-preferred time, they may have adverse side effect. And finally, dogging the clock. Can we develop new drugs to affect the clock? And this is a very new area. But for most of us, what matters is how can we train the clock? So maybe we may not have the need for clocking the drug or dogging the clock. So now, in light of all of this, now we can think of uh, this. We can apply the circadian rhythm principles, or we can call it the circadian theory of health, where the circadian knowledge will help us to prevent disease by optimizing behavior, and then if we fall sick, we can also increase the efficacy of the drug. So how do the rhythms actually work? Um, so for a long time, we knew that 
um, our brain has a clock, and just like our brain needs six to eight hours of sleep every night to reset and rejuvenate, almost every organ in our body has clock. So that means they need some downtime to reset and rejuvenate every night. And almost 15 years ago, we and others discovered that the whole system is in trend or linked to outside light dark cycle through light perceived mostly through the retina. But over the last six to eight years, we also came to learn that when food is presented at the wrong time, so in the middle of the night or at the non-preferred time, then that food signal can override the light signal and can disrupt these rhythms. And how do we use this information? So as Dr. Steve Oster introduced, my lab works a lot on uh, mice. So if we take two identical sets of mice and give one set of mouse standard healthy diet, another set of mice are given high fat diet and they're allowed to eat whenever they want, then within a few weeks, these mice that eat standard diet will remain healthy, whereas mice that eat high fat diet become obese and diabetic. But what is interesting is when mice are given high fat or energy dense diet, that diet disrupts their circadian rhythm. So instead of eating mostly at night time, they eat between day and night. So with this knowledge in hand, we asked how much of the disease is due to diet versus eating at the wrong time. So we did a very simple experiment only uh, six years ago where we took identical sets of mice. One group of mice got to eat a uh, high fat, high sugar diet whenever they want. The other group of mice was given the identical diet and identical number of uh, calories every day, but they had to eat everything within eight to 10 hours. And what was surprising was within nine to 36 weeks, starting from nine weeks onwards, the mice that ate randomly became obese, diabetic, and had all these diseases. Whereas mice that eat what we call in a time-restricted eating, where calorie is not restricted, but time is restricted, initially within eight to 10 hours, and in later experiment up to 12 hours, they remain completely healthy. And what is most exciting was if we take these fat and obese mice and put them in eight to 10 hours time restricted eating, then within the next 10 to 12 weeks, they also become healthy. So this was really exciting, but we wanted to know when people actually eat and whether people can change their eating behavior. So we started an app called My Circadian Clock. Anyone, anywhere in the world now can go to this website, uh, learn about the circadian clock, give an informed consent and download the app to self-monitor and modify the eating behavior. And initially, the app was very simple. You open the app, one click, take a picture, second click, and save it. And as soon as you saved it, it came to our website, to our server. And to make it simple, we put this uh, food timing on a timeline, and we monitor this eating behavior for up to three weeks, and we call it feedogram. So for example, here, we're looking at one person's eating behavior over three weeks period. And from here, we can now calculate what is the window of time when this person is most likely to eat, and that we call eating duration. So for example, if someone starts eating at 6 a.m. and stops at 6 p.m., that's 12 hours of eating. And if someone starts at 6 a.m. and stops at midnight, so that will be around 18 hours of eating. So what we found surprisingly is 50% of adults who do not even do shift work and do not um, uh, carry shift work, <laughs> uh, car carrying shift workers, they eat for 15 hours or longer. This was really eye-opening for us. And at the same time, it gave us the idea that if they change their behavior, perhaps they can improve their health. So uh, this is an ongoing project where in the first experiment, we had a small number of individuals who adopted what we call time-restricted eating, in which we advised them to, um, to be in bed for at least eight hours, so that gives them enough opportunity to sleep. So body is rested. And then in the morning, as our sleep hormones go down and alertness hormones go up within an hour after we wake up, we ask people to wait for at least an hour before they start eating. And then we ask them to see whether they can eat 
anything that we that you want of course you should not eat unhealthy diet excessive diet excessive food within 8 hours 10 hours 11 or maximum 12 hours and typically we ask people to target 10 hours because that's a good starting point so that means if someone starts eating at 8 a.m. then they go up to say 6 p.m. that's until when they can eat whatever they want but at the same time they should also be mindful about their sleep time because just like in the morning, there is a changing of guard. The sleep hormones are going down and wake-up hormones are going up. The reverse happens here. For two hours before going to bed, the wake-up hormones actually go down and sleep hormones begin to rise. And this is not an ideal time to eat. So in that way, people actually adapt. We are surprised to see that in a small cohort of people, uh, they could adopt this eating lifestyle and they lost a modest amount of body weight because the first experiment was done on only overweight people, not even with obese. So in 2015, we published that paper, the initial human study paper, and by 2016, uh, there are additional papers coming out in um, mostly in animal models and also some human epidemiological studies. So basically, all of this suggested that time-restricted eating or eating all your food within, say, 8 to 10 hours, a maximum of 12 hours, can prevent or reverse obesity, glucose intolerance, gut diseases, cardiovascular diseases, systemic inflammation, liver disease, cancer risk, cholesterol, sleep disorders, and also muscle function, and can improve muscle function. So as I said, most of these observations are from animals, and some of the observations are from humans. For example, now there are more and more papers coming out showing that People who eat uh, for 10 to 11 hours have low breast cancer risk and also uh, low prostate cancer risk. We are also seeing the effect of time restricted eating in reducing severity of certain neurological diseases, for example, Huntington disease. We are also seeing time restricted feeding reduces the severity of other infectious diseases uh, such as uh, septic shock. So in summary, what we are learning is a body is programmed to go through timely um, process of physiology, metabolism, and behavior. And those timetables keep us healthy. If we start an erratic lifestyle, so for example, eat or sleep randomly or less, or have less physical activity, or even the process of aging disrupts our circadian clock, then we are more prone to disease. But simple lifestyle choices, for example, sleeping enough, Avoiding bright light before bed, time restricted eating can reverse some of these conditions and can help us to live longer. And uh, the summary is, um, as I said, lifestyle is what, when, and how much we sleep, eat, and move. And by adopting a simple 8 to 10 hours time window, uh, this can act as a trigger point to improve quite a few of these lifestyle parameters. And with that, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panda. That's great. I'd, I'd like to tell all the uh, people watching and listening that after Dr. Longo's uh, presentation, we will have uh, an open question and answer period where you can ask questions to either or both of the participants. And if you wanted to get a head start on that, start typing in your questions now, then, then that might be a good idea as well. So I'd like to introduce now Dr. Walter Longo. He is the director of the Longevity Institute and the Edna Jones Professor of Gerontology and Biological Sciences at the University of Southern California. Uh, Dr. Longo is an internationally recognized as a leader in the field of aging research and related diseases. Uh, he's discovered some of the major genetic pathways involved in aging and has been called, and I really love this, a guru of longevity by Time Magazine. I, I, I don't know how you get that designation, Walter. I'd, I'd love to have it. On, I, think you, I think you got it too, right, Steve? Yeah, maybe I did. <laughs> anyway, he's recognized, uh, uh, by, one of the things he's done is he's really revolutionized the field of uh, the timing of eating. His work on the effects of fasting has absolutely been pioneering not only to maintain health but to combat stresses of various sorts. And he's got a, a, a new book out uh, called, um, let's see, The Longevity Diet. Um, 
And he's an advocate of, of what he calls the fasting mimicking diet. I have to mention that he received the FARS Vincent Cristofalo Rising Star Award in Aging Research in 2013, and his career was going great guns then and it's taken off since then. So I'll turn things over to Dr. Longo. Uh, welcome, Walter. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve. <clears throat> and uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in. And um, so I'll get started. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about uh, some background and, um, and then uh, and mostly about calorie restriction. And then I'll jump into uh, uh, the fasting mimicking diet. Um, so this is one of the slides that, that I, uh, I always show, which is... Uh, uh, what, uh, how much longer will we live if we cure cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes? It's about 13 years, uh, more or less. And I think that uh, what you hear from lots of us in the aging field is that, and this, uh, instead of speculation, I just put down, what if we were health as effective in extending the lifespan of people uh, or the healthy lifespan of people as we were already have achieved for mice? Uh, and that uh, will add 30 years. And of course, yeah, you could argue that that's speculation also, but um, that is definitely the potential that we can, uh, by uh, intervening on aging, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can add uh, years to life, but particularly healthy years. And there's something that I uh, like to talk about is not just gerontology, but also what I call juventology. And so how do we extend that period of life uh, now they might last 45 years, where we're actually young. You know, we can uh, perform at maximum level. And, um, and so that's as important as lifespan, so as health span. So health span, you know, you can be healthy uh, with, when you're 85 years old, um, but you're not young anymore. You're not youthful anymore. Um, and so I, I think we should uh, look both at, at how do we stay young, and how we get old and, and stay healthy, right? These are, are two different things. They're both uh, as important, but I think uh, maybe the first one is being uh, studied uh, less than it should. Um, so the, uh, uh, I, I uh, talk about the longevity diet um, as uh, all the things that um, can be done uh, nutritionally to, uh, to affect the health span and, and probably youth span. Um, and, but calorie restriction, you know, the reduction of 30%, the calorie intake by 30% below the normal level. So somebody uh, had a, a 2,500 uh, uh, calorie normal uh, diet, that would be reduced, let's say, 1,750, right? So this has been done for a long time, not just in humans, but in all kinds of organisms. And, uh, and it's got uh, positive and negative. And I'll just say a few things about that. So the positive we're very clear when the Richard Weindruck at the University of Wisconsin um, did uh, a long, long study on monkeys and saw some monkeys uh, uh, ate normally, uh, stayed fairly healthy, and a fairly healthy diet, uh, not the best diet in the world, but, but something reasonable. And, uh, and then uh, a group of monkeys um, were given the same diet, but 30% uh, or so uh, calorie restricted. And the, the results are remarkable. And as you can see here, they, uh, um, uh, about 60% of the uh, uh, monkeys on the uh, control diet, on the regular diet, developed a diabetes. Um, and, and this was completely absent in the calorie-restricted monkeys. And also, uh, both uh, uh, cancer or tumors and cardiovascular diseases were reduced by 50%. So if you think about this, it's really, really extraordinary, uh, the results. But uh, if you look here at the all-cause mortality, uh, this is for the calorie-restricted monkeys, and this is for the regular monkeys, and you really don't see that much of a difference. You see big, the bigger difference here when we're looking at age-related mortality, so the death caused by these diseases. And of course, this makes a big difference here. But if you really look at all causes, uh, you don't see a big difference. So what's happening? Well, uh, the, uh, this is also uh, uh, was done originally by, by Walford, who was my, my mentor back in the early 90s at UCLA. And, and Walford and other seven people uh, went inside of this biosphere too in Arizona, and they did the first human uh, uh, trial uh, on, uh, on calorie restriction. 
And so they began eating about 1,800 calories a day. And the results, I think, uh, just as for the monkeys, uh, were remarkable. So, for example, if you look at uh, systolic blood pressure here, you see that it goes from 110 uh, to uh, about 90, and glucose level uh, dropped dramatically. And these, consider that these were uh, healthy uh, subjects, eight healthy subjects. You see they start with fasting glucose 90, and they drop down to uh, 70 or so. And cholesterol drops dramatically, on and on and on. So um, in agreement with the monkey studies, and, and not just these studies, this was a pilot study, and then there's been a number of groups uh, that have, have repeated this in many more patients, then you really see these extraordinary changes in the marker of, um, of diseases and, and risk factors for diseases. So clearly, uh, we know now that many of these modern diseases, or at least for many people, uh, we can intervene. You know, uh, the, the problem is, how do we intervene uh, when this is the state of a calorie-restricted person? This is Roy Walford, when he was in Biosphere 2, and after, let's say, a year and a half or so of calorie restriction. So, clearly, he's in, 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 a, uh, in a very extreme uh, restricted state, and the, and the muscle mass, et cetera, shows that. So, really, um, uh, calorie, restrict or, uh, calorie restriction done this way is uh, uh, too extreme, and it's not surprising what I showed uh, just now in the monkeys, that you get the benefits on diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and probably many other diseases. But then, in the end, you live just a little bit longer. And, and that's great, but it's certainly something that very few people are willing to do, and, and probably uh, people shouldn't do, right? So uh, considering this uh, near or anorexic uh, uh, state uh, caused by the calorie restriction. So how do, we, uh, how do we get the benefits of calorie restriction and, and without the problems. And, and so for a long time, I've been working on, on, on starvation. And, uh, and many years ago, I, I started working on how do you, what happens to a starving bacteria. And it happens that they live longer, even if you starve them permanently. And what happens to a starving yeast? And they also live longer, uh, even if you starve them permanently. And the same thing is Matt Camberlin uh, showed uh, that this in, in worms, right? So you can starve them for a long, long time, and they actually live longer. So you start thinking, well, this is uh, um, strange that this is just a coincidence. So it must, must be something about starvation that not only extends the lifespan of organisms, it makes them much stronger. So all of a sudden, this, all, all these organisms, uh, while they're starving, they become very protected against almost anything that you can throw at them. And, uh, um, so, uh, but of course, you can't uh, starve, a, a, uh, and you don't want to starve, as I just showed, uh, even for the calorie restriction, uh, a, a person... Uh, for very long. And, and so we um, started developing, and this was mostly due to our work in cancer. So we were, wor we were uh, working with cancer and cancer patients, and we were using water-only fasting. So we were putting patients on, on four, three, four days of just water. And, uh, um, and then in clinical trials, of course, at, at USC, and then we were, uh, and then the, the oncologists were giving them chemo, uh, in the middle or, or after several days of this water-only uh, fasting. And, uh, and what happened was almost no patient wanted to do that and almost no oncologist wanted to do that. Do that. And uh, so uh, the National Cancer Institute uh, um, uh, asked us to uh, uh, find, identify what we call a fasting-mimicking diet, right? So, um, so they, uh, in, in part, thanks to, to the U.S. government, we were able to uh, develop this fasting-making diet. So what's the purpose of the FMD? Uh, this FMD, uh, the purpose is to uh, allow the patient to eat uh, as much as possible uh, while getting all the changes that you normally see uh, during starvation, the water-only fasting, right? So we have several markers without going into the details. One is glucose, sugar. Uh, one is IGF-1. One is something called IGF-PP-1. And the other one are ketone bodies. You, you hear about ketogenic diet. Well, the ketogenic diet is called, is, is called ketogenic diet because uh, the body in that moment has high levels of these ketone bodies. And the brain, for example, begins to uh, use less sugar or fuel and more of these ketone bodies. So this is a, a low calorie, low sugar, low protein, high unsaturated fat uh, diet. And it's mostly a vegan, a vegan diet. So 
uh, what did we show? Well, one of the original things that we showed was if you, start, if you take mice that are middle age and you begin this, uh, the mice uh, live longer, uh, but more importantly, they're living uh, longer, they, um, they seem to be protected from all kinds of problems. And, and one, of the, one of these uh, um, effects is on the immune system. And I'm just going to summarize it by saying this is the level of white blood cells, so immune cells uh, in a young mouse. And this is the level in an older mouse. And this is the level in an older mouse that is done uh, by four months of the cycles of this. Uh, these are four days of the fasting mimicking diet uh, once every couple of weeks, right? So twice a month, the mice at middle age, they were put on these four days of a fasting mimicking diet. And you see that the level of white blood cells is uh, restored or returns to the, the more youthful level. And also something called uh, lymphoid myeloid ratio, which is affected negatively by aging, uh, as you see here, is at least uh, partially restored. So essentially, there is a, a rejuvenation, regeneration and rejuvenation of the immune system and, uh, in the mouse. And we published several papers on this. And uh, um, so uh, what is one of the effects of this? Well, we don't know for sure, but when we looked at the tumors, you see all these, all these gray dots. Each gray dot is a, is a tumor uh, in, identified in, in the mice. So we started the fasting weekend diet here around 16 months, and a few months later, uh, the mice that are on the regular diet, they start developing tumors. But you see the red. These are the mice that are on the cycles of the FMD. They don't develop the tumors for the first between 20 and 24 months. They develop one at 24 months, and then you really start seeing uh, the tumors after 26 months. And, but if you, you, you consider the entire lifespan, uh, uh, you see about a 45% reduction in the tumor. So they, uh, they live longer. Uh, the immune system is now partially rejuvenated, and, uh, and probably one of the effects of this is this uh, major reduction in, uh, in tumors. What else? Uh, well, I mean, we've done many studies, but the, the, I think the most fantastic uh, effect is this, which is during the fasting making diet. Um, and I just start by showing you, you look at these uh, columns here. You see the green column, and then you see one that's got lots of red, and then you see another one that's got lots of red. Well, the green column is basically uh, telling you that during nor the normal diet in the pancreas of mice, uh, all the sort of embryonic development associated, so the genes that are uh, the stem cells and the genes in the stem cells that are normally associated with uh, the development of organs when we are first born, they're all turned off. So green means they're shut off, right? All of them are shut off. And then you, you see that in, during the fasting making diet, they start turning up. And, and one day after refeeding, the last column on the right, they're still on, right? So that, what that is telling you is that there, there is a reprogramming of the pancreatic cell uh, into an, a more embryonic-like state during this long fasting mimicking diet. And if you see this panel here, this is the, um, uh, the, 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 the insulin-producing beta cell of the pancreas. And you see normally they, there's a lot of red. The red cells are insulin-producing. Then we give them this toxin, and the insulin-producing beta cells are killed, and 50 days later, they're still gone, right? So this is what essentially type 1 diabetes looks like, right? The, the pancreas is now able to make insulin. And then, uh, but if you start the fasting mimicking diet, if you start here when there is very little insulin uh, producing cells that are, that are active, uh, then you start the fasting mimicking diet. And then very rapidly, after about four or five cycles, you get to this state where the pancreas is now making normal levels of insulin. And if you look at this, is the hyperglycemia caused by these defects in the pancreas and in the control mice that have damaged pancreas. And you see here we start the fasting mimicking diet. You see the sugar levels come down, and then eventually they make it to near normal level. Right? So, so that this is telling us that, and, and now we have a number of papers in different organs, that it's a multi-system, multi-organ uh, uh, regeneration process. And, um, and this regeneration process, in this case, was able to reverse in mice both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, okay, so then we uh, uh, connected to the immune system and this rejuvenation of the immune system uh, in Young in the lab. 
look at um, the uh, uh, autoimmune disorder. This is like multiple sclerosis, like autoimmune disorder that uh, we, uh, we generate in the mouse. And, you know, we're making a long story short here, um, once we develop, the mice develop autoimmunity, um, they, uh, they uh, maintain it for a long time. This is really permanent. Uh, and you see here is that the, the white dots and the uh, blue triangles is when we start the fasting in diet. And you see that, that we block the progression and we actually reduce the, the, the pathology. And in about 20% of the mice, the pathology goes back to zero. And in about 50%, there is a major reduction, right? So uh, without going into too much detail, it seems like uh, fasting is actually in a state in the mouse uh, system that is able to recognize uh, damaged cells, autoimmune cells, uh, kill them off, and replace them with normal uh, T cells and, and in general white blood cells. Okay, so what about people? Uh, well, it, um, of course, we develop a, a, a human version of the fasting weekend diet, you know, low calorie, low protein, low sugar, high fat, good fat, vegan. And, um, and the clinical trial was, um, three uh, cycles of five days of this fasting weekend diet. So we, we recruit about 100 people, and then we start uh, giving them um, uh, either a normal diet, they continue the normal diet, or we randomize them to the fasting weekend diet. So five days, once a month. So five days on the diet, and then they continue to do whatever it is that they normally do. Uh, so normal exercise, normal diet in between cycles. And we looked at all kinds of uh, different markers, and, the, um, and you see here these differential effects, for example, and very different from calorie restriction, by the way, where remember, even somebody that had low glucose, the, calorie, the permanent calorie restriction will drive the glucose lower and lower and lower. Here, we didn't see that. So if somebody started with normal glucose level, they stayed at the same level. So if somebody started as a pre-diabetic with you know, high glucose level, so in the 105, 110 range, then the great majority of patients that started pre-diabetic moved back to the normal uh, glycemia. And similarly, um, we, uh, we saw effects, sorry, we saw effects on IGF-1. This is a, a potential risk factor for cancer. It's not been established as a risk factor, but people that had, uh, um, in, but there's lots of epidemiological data and more data, including our own work, suggesting that high IGF-1 is associated with high cancer rates. And, uh, and you see that people that had a, a normal level of IGF-1, they had a drop in IGF-1, but uh, people that had a high IGF-1 to begin with, they had a much higher uh, drop. Uh, C-reactive protein, this is a, a, a marker for systemic inflammation, and, uh, and it's also a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And again, you see here, uh, subjects started on a, uh, with a normal CRP, so they, they did not have an inflammation, a systemic inflammation, nothing happened. But those that started with high CRP, they dropped. And, and again, as we've seen for the, for the pre-diabetic uh, patients, most of them returned to the normal level. So what we think is happening in mice, I just told you there is multi-system regeneration and so stem cells are really uh, participating in not just stem cells, I mean, cells are also uh, intracellularly regenerating. And, um, and so we see here an increase in, in stem cell and circulating stem cells. So we're now, it's very difficult to prove regeneration, uh, multi-system regeneration in people, but, uh, but we're trying to do that. And this is this elevation of the stem cell number uh, uh, during the fasting making diet is, uh, uh, suggests uh, these effects on, uh, on regeneration. And so, diet, aging, toxin, uh, disease risk goes up, and we think this uh, fasting mimicking diet, each cycle uh, reduces uh, these, these markers, and with the markers, it rejuvenates at least a little bit the uh, multiple systems, and that's how we think uh, uh, we're gaining these, uh, uh, these changes, and we believe we can get lots of the effects that I showed you earlier for this chronic calorie restriction. And, and I just end uh, with Roy Walford, a picture, and this is an exaggeration, of course, you know, five days of a fasting-making diet that do not cause anything like this. 
Uh, there is a very minor, in fact, there is no loss of lean body mass. But I just want to prove the point here, which is Walford before this long-term car restriction, then Walford after you know, a year and a half of car restriction. And the point here is about shrinking, organ shrinking. So his liver in this state is probably half of the size that his liver uh, in, in this state. Then Walford returns to the normal diet and, and everything expands again. And so this is what's probably missing in the color restriction because there is never a refeeding period, but it's going from a, a, a partial, and not as extreme, but a partial uh, atrophy to a, 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 a normal diet. That is probably the most important moment. And as I showed you earlier, that's where all these embryonic uh, associated, the embryonic development associated genes are turned on. And so we think that uh, the fasting making diet at each cycle is uh, promoting uh, a little bit of this uh, uh, shrinking and regeneration, rejuvenation. And that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Longo. So let's, let's take a few questions from the uh, participants now. Uh, one of the questions, uh, this is for Dr. Panda, several people have said when they first get up, they have, they have a cup or two of coffee and maybe some chewing gum. And does, does that count? Does that start the clock if you're trying to do uh, time-restricted feeding? Well, as I said, most of our um, studies are done in mice, and we cannot simulate that. Um, but recently, there are papers showing that caffeine itself can reset the clock. And the effect of caffeine is equivalent to um, cup of, uh, sorry, one hour of light. So the bottom line is, uh, if coffee is absolutely necessary uh, to wake you up, uh, it's better to have black coffee and stay awake when you are driving and to drive sleepy. Um, next is, if that's the only joy in life, then better have it, but uh, try to have black coffee. Uh, but having no coffee after lunchtime or 2 p.m. is actually much better uh, for improving your sleep. So the window for coffee is very narrow between morning and maybe lunchtime. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, here's a question uh, for, for Dr. Longo. He says, I just completed a five-day fasting mimicking diet. I was very worried about muscle loss. Can you explain uh, the effect of the fasting mimicking diet on muscle? Yeah, so we, we tested that, and, and during the diet, in fact, there was a minor uh, reduction in lean body mass, but then uh, after the refeeding, one week of refeeding, even after three cycles of the fasting mimicking diet, uh, um, in one of the arms, uh, there was a, a no change in, in limb body mass, and in fact, there was an increase in relative limb body mass, so muscle to the rest of the, of the mass, fat, etc. Um, and in the other arm, uh, there was a very minor uh, borderline significant reduction. So, uh, and again, an increase in relative uh, limb body mass. So, yes, it is, uh, of course, the, the fasting can cause some loss of, uh, of muscle mass, but then the refeeding, uh, we believe uh, can cause uh, some regeneration of the muscle mass. We're now testing it in a clinical trial at the University of Verona, where we're actually testing muscle strength and endurance. Um, so in mice, we see them performing better muscularly with the rotor rod and other tests after many cycles of the FMD. Uh, in people, we're actually testing the possibility that uh, this could be uh, strengthening uh, the muscle. Okay, thank you. Here, so I used to I used to work a job from uh, uh, twelve midnight until seven in the morning. So one of the participants has asked a question to Dr. Panda: What if you work a swing shift or a graveyard shift? What options do you do, and how does that affect your health? And is there anything that you can do about that? Yeah. So for people with shift work, it's a constant challenge, and the challenge is actually when they move back and forth between the swing shift or graveyard shift back to regular social life. And uh, what we're finding with people with successful shift work and staying healthy, they try to eat within their uh, work time um, and they try to eat also nutritious food. And uh, what is more important is to get that restorative six to eight hours of sleep during daytime. Um, and once one can achieve these two, 
eating all your food within your working time and then getting six to eight hours of sleep during daytime by avoiding coffee three to four hours before going to bed, uh, staying in a completely dark room, reducing temperature, having some background noise, then you can reduce the adverse effect of shift work. Uh, we are still uh, doing some more specific research. Uh, in fact, we are currently enrolling firefighters from San Diego uh, Fire and Rescue Department to go through a one-year time-restricted study um, in conjunction with their shift work to see how they can better adapt to uh, shift work with time-restricted eating. All right. Thank you. Um, question for Dr. Longo. It says, could, can you go into detail about the fasting mimicking diet cycles? How much time on the diet versus how much on a regular diet? Do you have a recommendation for that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I wrote a book. I don't make a penny out of it. All the, all the income from the book goes to foundations uh, and research. But in the book, I, I detail that. But in general, the, um, the recommendation is the following. The book is called The Longevity Diet. Uh, the, the recommendation is the following. Um, five days. We, we, I, I always say, and, I, you know, I, uh, I, I hope uh, Sachin agrees with me, uh, some of these, you know, let's say even the 12-hour fast uh, and the 16-hour fast, some of these are, um, are certainly uh, very safe. But some of the more experimental ones, let's say 16-hour fast or the five-day fasting-making diet, you should do it when you need to do it. Now, I think most people need to do the five-day uh, FMD at least once or twice a year. But that's it. Uh, now, if somebody is obese and has high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and high uh, glycemia, high uh, glucose, fasting glucose level, then maybe uh, this is uh, needed once a month. It's good to talk to your doctor, to talk to your dietitian, and, um, and then uh, consider doing it once a month until you move to a, uh, um, a uh, uh, more healthy state, and then you can make it uh, maybe every four months or so. We think on average uh, somebody in the United States may want to do it once every four months. But again, it should be on a need-to-do it basis rather than uh, thinking, oh, let me do it you know, every 15 days because I feel good on it. Um, you know, eventually we might get there, um, and uh, now I think it's, it's still premature uh, to uh, to do it without a need. Okay, thank you. Uh, time for a couple of more questions. One for Dr. Panda here. Uh, what is the time for fat digestion or metabolism? Is there a best time to eat fat as opposed to other types of dietary components? Well, I can uh, flip the question and <laughs> say, what is the best time to eat say, <laughs> sugar? <laughs> Uh, what we know from circadian rhythm and how our pancreas uh, has a rhythm, actually our best insulin sensitivity happens in the first half of the day. So that means having more carbohydrate if you are intending to consume more carbohydrate. So the first half is better for carbohydrate. So that leaves the second half uh, maybe for fat and protein. And strategically, that's also... Um, beneficial because, as we know, fat and protein reduce hunger, so it helps people to go through, say, 12, 14, or 15, 16 hours of fast uh, overnight. So the take-home message is maybe the first half of the day is better for complex carb, I won't say simple sugar, and then the second half of the eating cycle may be slightly more fat and protein. Okay, thank you. Um, well, actually, I think our, our time is up. For those of you who are on the line, please uh, hang on for another couple of minutes. Uh, thanks to both uh, presenters. Uh, fascinating stuff. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody that, that this webinar will be online al along with the slide. And at this point, I'd like to turn things back over to John Chach from afar. Thank you, Dr. Osted. And thank you once again, Drs. Longo and Panda, for your um, extremely interesting presentation. We hope that all of you um, not only got a lot out of today's webinar, but will um, watch it again online. The webinar will be posted on AFAR's website, which you see on our screen now, afar.org. 
and um, follow us on Afar Org on Facebook or Twitter for updates on when that recording will be live. You can also read more about Dr. Longo and Dr. Panda's research in one of Dr. Osted's columns on Next Avenue. So um, continue to um, look at nextavenue.org for more insights from AFAR researchers. Thank you again for joining us, and we would greatly appreciate if you would please complete a brief survey to let us know um, how the webinar met your expectations and Tell us what other topics you'd like to be covered in future webinars. The webinar, I'm sorry, the survey will be available when you log out of the webinar now. Thank you again.